this year, um, I am absolutely delighted on behalf of the Business and Community Foundation uh, to be uh, introducing to you someone who, as they say, genuinely needs no introduction, Dr. Vandana Shiva. Now, I am going to invite her up with once again an expression of our huge appreciation of your being with us. I had not imagined I would dedicate my life to biodiversity. And for those who don't know the meaning, it just means the diversity of life on this planet. From the tiniest of microbes, to the ecosystems, to the varieties of crops. And increasingly, I'm finding out the biggest, biggest ecosystem is our gut. Um, and the connections that this has with how we deal with the soil, how we deal with the land, the water. A very important part of the mechanistic thought is everything is divided, everything is fragmented, everything is separate. So for example, Newton said, God made the world in immutable particles that could not change. But not only did the particles become subparticles and subatomic particles, they're constantly hunting. Today's physicist is always hunting to the next level of smallness. But the world was made, wasn't made up of immutable particles. And that's where my quantum theory education helped a lot. That the world is made of flux. It's made of potential. The fundamental unit in the world is potential. That potential expresses itself, maybe sometimes as a particle, in consolidation as this table, or you in your amazing diversity. But it's the potential that is the basic, and the expression of that potential into a wave or a particle depends on how you measure, because that interaction is what allows the different forms to exist. And because you could be a particle and you could be a wave, there's no guarantee what you'll be. Therefore, there is probability and not determinism. There's uncertainty rather than absolute predictability of the kind you can make when on Newton's model or Descartes' model or Bacon's model, you have the position and the velocity and you can say this is where this particle will be tomorrow. No idea where the particle will be tomorrow because it might not be a particle tomorrow. <laughs> And I found something very exciting just the other day, that they're now figuring out that even something like simple like photosynthesis, weren't able to get how the plant does it. You know, this amazing taking of the carbon dioxide we put out and converting it into oxygen. They're now realizing the way the phenomena gets actually explained is through quantum phenomena, not through mechanical phenomena, because on mechanical assumptions it doesn't work that there must be coexistence of all diversity. That it's not a monoculture of just one species, one age, one gender, one class, the kind of mono or one religion, whatever, the kind of monocultures that lead to violence. Ecological monocultures lead to violence against nature. When Babur came to India, his records are in a book called Babar Nama, his memoirs. And one of the very early sentences in that memoir is, diversity is the Hindustan way. Hindustan was the name given to the land beyond the Indus. So all of us, in, with all our diversity, were called Hindus as a geographical location, just as everyone today with all the races that are now in England, are British. He then goes on to talk about how every climate is here, and it's so true. Up in the Himalaya, you have the third pole. You've got the Arctic, you've got the Antarctic, and the third pole is right here in the Himalaya. In the deserts of Rajasthan, which is interestingly the most populated desert of the world because people learned how to conserve water and grow food and cultivate biodiversity by making that biodiversity sacred. So every ecosystem of the world is right here, which has then led to the flourishing of diversity. 
And that flourishing of diversity has shaped our cultures very, very much. I mean, my own work has focused very, very much on the biodiversity in our agriculture. In India, of the 250 who are hungry, half are farmers. And I watched with my own eyes. A farmer has grown rice, borrowed for the chemicals, can't eat the rice, has to give it to the trader who sold him the chemicals on credit, goes hungry himself, then goes to buy rice at four times the price. And so rural areas are just declining in their nutritional status every year when they should be the ones with the first entitlement. And finally, a farmer should be producing for the nutrition, health, quality. After all, food is about taste too. Food is about relishing. Food is about giving our bodies the nourishment it needs. When food is made into a commodity, and all that's measured is the commodity that left the farm, soil gets impoverished, farmer gets impoverished, your food gets impoverished, because commodities, it doesn't matter what's in it. You know, A ton of wheat with no nutrition is equal to a ton of wheat with nutrition. So in Punjab, the land of the Green Revolution, the governor of Punjab ticked off <laughs> the Agriculture University vice chancellor who was saying, we did the Green Revolution, we did this, we did this, we did this. And he says, but you know, I get my wheat from Madhya Pradesh. Now, the wheat of Madhya Pradesh doesn't give you gluten allergies. The wheat of Madhya Pradesh has 9% protein. The wheat of Punjab is tasteless. The chapati rots in one day. Can't be kept. The Madhya Pradesh chapatis will sit for four days and not go rotten. So the quality disappeared in the measurement of commodification. And what we've done is bring quality and nutrition back. We measure nutrition per acre. And over the 30 years that we've done the work, these are real farms of real farmers we've measured it on. We've taken the diversity of output rather than a monoculture yield. Then we've to converted that diversity into nutrition on the basis of the National Institution of Nutrition tables. We can feed to Indias if we conserve biodiversity. So when I started the work, people used to say, we can't afford to have biodiversity because we've got to feed the world. Therefore, we've had to have monocultures. Therefore, we have to have chemicals. But this work is showing to feed the world you need diversity. What is also coming out from science now is the more diversity you have in your fields, the more you can avoid chemical inputs. I'll give you just two other examples. I mentioned about the pest. You have diversity, you don't need to spray pesticides. You have diversity, you don't have weed problems. When you have weed problems, you first bring a chemical called glyphosate or Roundup. Roundup then kills everything green. Many of these greens in India are actually food. I did a study long ago in Bangalore. 250 species of greens that women eat are uncultivated. They're not crops they plant, but the amaranth that grows on its own. And that is some of the richest source of food. So as long as you have that in your field, you don't have malnutrition. As soon as you start saying only the soya matters or only the wheat matters, and then you start spraying, you get rid of a large part of nutrition, but now you have a toxic in your food. The World Health Organization last year announced that glyphosate is a carcinogen. Now in 85, Monsanto knew this. Glyphosate is the gen generic name. Roundup is the trade name of the same compound with some ad additives on it. And then you come to the soil. The soil is some of the richest source of biodiversity. But the minute you spray urea, you put urea into the soil, that biodiversity dies. Howard, whose work I mentioned, wrote, a soil teeming with healthy life in the shape of abundant microflora and microfauna 
will bear healthy plants. And these, when consumed by animals and man, will confer health on animals and man. But an infertile soil, that is one lacking in sufficient microbial, fungal, and other life, will pass on other, some form of deficiency to the plant, and such plants, in turn, will pass on that deficiency to animals and man. Many of the micronutrients and trace element deficiencies that are responsible for many diseases today are beginning with the soil. And that is because we substituted the work of the biodiversity of the soil with the toxicity of external inputs, like urea. A Danish study found that in a cubic meter of soil, there were 5,000 earthworms, 50,000 insects and mites, 12 million roundworms, and a gram of soil contained 30,000 protozoa, 50,000 algae, 400,000 fungi, of which the most important is this mycorrhizal fungi about which Howard wrote that this is the most important organism. This mycorrhizal fungi goes out and in one cubic inch, there can be eight miles of this fungi. It goes out and reaches out and collects the nutrients wherever they are. When this is dead, you can keep applying nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. The systems to pick it up and bring it to the plant aren't there anymore. Toxics in our food. By forgetting biodiversity. And not looking at what these poisons do to the biodiversity in the soil, the biodiversity of our plants, the biodiversity in our gut. So you know what the predictions are for the United States? that by the year 2025, on the graph that's growing, one in two children will be autistic. So when we talk about our common future, linked to biodiversity, we are talking about that. How healthy are our communities? How healthy are our children? Now, all of you are studying business management. And Business is ancient. Business management being taught is new. Usually the child of a businessman learned how to do the business. But this 200-year-old era of thinking mechanically in science has entered mechanically into economics, where we think everything is separate, where we think there are no connections and interrelationships. And therefore, we take actions without thinking of consequences. Because if everything is separate, what I do doesn't make a difference to you. But if we are connected in community, then what I do makes a difference to you. And therefore, I must be thoughtful. If what I do makes a difference to the soil and the biodiversity and the water, then care for the soil and the water and biodiversity becomes part of my thinking about how I do business. So, there's a biodiversity approach, and there's a mechanical monoculture approach. It's an approach to life. It's an approach to society. It's an approach to governance. It's an approach, uh, approach to science. But it is also an approach to economics and business. So while we started all this work, because I wanted to create a nonviolent agriculture system, and I was also not uh, I didn't accept the fact that a handful of these chemical companies came out and started writing laws and saying, we, from now onwards, we'll be the inventors of seed. I said, seed has come from generations before us, millennia of nature's work and our ancestors' work. The 200,000 rice varieties that India created, 200,000. Did you know? That's the kind of rice diversity we had before the Green Revolution. In Navdanya, we had rescued and saved 3,000. Many of these we just saved because we worked on the basic assumption that nature knows what she was doing. Our ancestors knew what they were doing. Super cyclone hits Orissa. Some of the rices, by, by their name, tell us they are salt tolerant were the ones through which we could rescue farming in Orissa. And then in 2004, when the tsunami hit, farmers of Orissa could send two trucks of salt-tolerant seeds 
after the government of Tamil Nadu has said to me, we can't do agriculture for five years, we'll have to give an agriculture holiday because there's too much salt. And when the rain will wash away the salt in five years, we can farm again. I said, no, we have salt tolerant seeds. And the department there says, can't be. This is the response I get all the time, a can't be response, which is why I built uh, the Beach Vidya Peet and Navdanya Center in Dehradun, and I hope some of you with your institutions will have an opportunity to learn from biodiversity, where biodiversity is the teacher. We call it Beach Vidya Peet, and we call it the Earth University. Um, these seeds, no one would have imagined. We've been saving ragi and mandua as forgotten foods. We've been saving amaranth. And now everyone's falling so sick. They're turning to millets. So all of these seeds, that were, they used to be called primitive varieties. Can you imagine? They were called primitive crops. I don't mind, Mark, but I think into science and into agriculture, infiltrated a bit of racism. If it was white sugar, it was better than our gourd, even though it's the one that gives us disease. If it's refined flour, better. It's the one that gives problems. If it's polished rice, better. And now we're having to come back to celebration of diversity. And when we do our millet festival, we call it black is beautiful. Because it makes brownish chapati, you know? And then when you get used to having everything white, you get embarrassed that your chapati is brown. I think we need to start celebrating our brownness. The brownness of our food and the brownness of our skin. And with it, celebrate the centuries of wisdom and learning that we must distill for shaping the future, our common future. So this issue of patenting is actually creating an uncommon future. Five companies say they own the seed. So I said, no, we will save seeds, and I will do what I can legally to not allow the patenting of seed to become the norm. I'm very happy that in India, every law we've written did not allow it. Our patent laws say biological processes are not inventions. We drafted, and I was part of the expert group, the Plant Variety Act, which they wanted for their monopoly. We have a clause Farmers' rights. Farmers are breeders. Farmers have an inalienable right to save, exchange, distribute, breed, sell seed. Can't be taken away. Only law in the world that has articulated this in black and white. We have a very strong biodiversity law, which came out of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which again recognizes that we have an amazing heritage. We also fought cases. The first was in 19, 1984, the Bhopal disaster. I said, why are we using these poisons? And I took neem saplings from Delhi. In those days, there was no concrete on the pavements. It used to be all mud. I, I always say it's because there were no contracts for making pavements and digging them up and making them again, and digging them up and making them again. There was a very beautiful BBC show, Mere Desh Ki Dharti Sona Ugle, you know, which is basically about making pavements forever. But in those days, it was soil, and therefore when the Nimoli fell, you got neem saplings. I took a bucket full of neem saplings and said, no more Bhopals plant a neem. 10 years later, I find neem has been patented for its pesticide use. We built a huge neem campaign. I collected 100,000 signatures from across the country, went to the European Patent Office, and challenged this patent held jointly by a US Department of Agriculture and W.R. Grace, which already had created a lot of damage in the United States. And it's recorded in a film called The Civil Action, where they had taken the toxics and injected it into the groundwater. So in that area, children were being born with cancer. And eventually, it was the mothers who discovered what had happened and fought this case, and eventually won. It took me 11 years to fight this case on Neem. We started in 94, in 2005, that patent, which I call a biopiracy patent. We gave the name biopiracy to this phenomena of taking what is a collective heritage what is biodiversity? What is the traditional knowledge associated with that diversity? And saying, my invention. I invented neem. 
And then a company in Texas says, I invented Basmati. We took that on also. And we challenged through the Supreme Court of India because we wanted the government to join. We also did a movement in the US. And I remember there were these old church ladies in Texas who made cards, which they sent to the US Patent and Trademark Office. And basically, the card said, if you don't strike down this patent of piracy of Basmati, we will have to rename you the US Piracy and Theft Office. There's a huge, big issue right now we're dealing with. There are too many patents. There are 1,500. So like I mentioned, we have the salt tolerant seeds. We have other seeds. Now they're just doing tappa. They don't even bother anymore to do anything. They just put a stamp and say, this seed is ours, this seed is ours, this seed is ours. 1,500 patent on climate resilient seeds that our farmers have evolved. So what our response to this is to, of course, challenge the piracy, challenge this myth of innovation, but save the seeds in the commons. Which is, I won't go into too much detail on this, but right now, there's a big issue in India because the government eventually acted on putting a ceiling on the price of seed, of BT cotton seed, which is the main reason for farmer suicides in the cotton areas. 80,000% jump in the price of seed. Finally, the government acted, put a ceiling. Monsanto takes them to court and says, sorry, you can't regulate us. And I intervened in the case in um, Karnataka. <laughs> Amazing language. A BT cotton seed is not a cotton seed. I'm intervening in the Supreme Court of Argentina, where Argentina, like India, does not recognize patents on plants. Monsanto is saying, the GMO soya plant is not a plant. To knock down the law and get patents when they can't get patents. So I'm writing a biggish piece now on how in the Monsanto world, a seed is not a seed, a plant is not a plant, a government is not a government, a law is not a law, democracy is not democracy, constitutions are not constitutions. There's only one lawmaking written by them. And I think this is a major threat to democracy. So there is the democracy of the farmer having the right to save seed, which is what we have dedicated ourselves to in Navdanya. This is the democracy of the eater to know what they're eating, but also to have access to good food. My next book is what's going on with the concentration of power. These five companies that originally thought they'd patent all seed are now becoming three. Monsanto's merging with Bayer, Syngenta with ChemChina, Dow has merged with DuPont. And then next year, because of the financial imperative, they'll have to become one. And the way it all becomes very profitable is shed a few more employees. So you're moving towards a speculation economy, not just in finance, but also in agriculture. If I was to read out how they get their patents, they're actually admitting. They say, we have a software program, and we allow it to choose 100 lottery tickets. This is about breeding. The software program chooses 100 lottery tickets on which we bet. And we take the patent and start pushing and marketing them. Every family has a cancer victim. Every second person is a diabetic. Neurological problems everywhere. Hypertension everywhere. Most of it rooted in food. And I would like to tell all of you, invite all of you right here in this hall, 1st of October, linked to Gandhi's birth anniversary, we do an annual festival called Bhumi. This year it is about healing the planet and healing our bodies the links between ecological health and planetary health and our health. All the work we've done, I always say to myself, my God, wouldn't it be wonderful if there were 100 young people turning this into their entrepreneurship, making this their life's business. And it's not that you can't do business in ethical ways. All you have to do is shift from that linear mechanical thinking of extraction. How can I extract more and more from society? How can I extract more and more from nature? To shifting through the laws that biodiversity teaches us. First, pluralism. 
Second, the law of return. That is how biodiversity works, on the law of return. Mutuality symbiosis, giving back. For my 45 years, that's what I've done. And I think for another 20 years I can carry on because my soul was not destroyed, my conscience was not extinguished. Each of you has so much to contribute. I want to offer from Navdania and our team an opportunity to each of your institutions to see how all that you have learned can really become business in service to the earth and business in service to community. Thank you.